First of all, I would like to thank Avatore, is that right? Avocato Amacarelli for inviting me and the organizers for helping me escape from the Canadian blizzard. Now my, um, my presentation is, will be in English, but quite a lot of the text is in French. This is normal in Quebec. And I will be looking at the recent applications of the Abu Picard law. There's a terrible echo here, isn't there? Should I just use one? Hmm? Okay. Oops. Okay. So the Abu Pikar law of 2001, who created it and why? Some of you may already know the answer to this question, but it was two senators at the uh, National Assembly, socialists, Nicolas Abu and Catherine Picard, and she's now the head of uh, uh, UNADFI. And um, uh, here you see a photograph of her and also the president of, the former pre president of Mivilud. So the point is, the people who created the Abu Pikar law were um, dedicated um, cult watchers, I guess we'd call them anti-cultists anti in America, or they belong to the anti-sect movement in France. Now if you read her book, uh, co-authored with Anne Fournier, she explains why um, she contributed to this law. All French jurisprudence protects freedom of conscience, but freedom of association should only apply to groups that do not attack human rights or disturb the public order or individual liberties. This is what she says. Since les sects perpetrate these very kind of attacks and disturbances, they qualify as illicit associations, not as valid religions. It is the role of the pouvoir public, she argues, to prevent all harm to society and individuals. And in her book, she says, what we need is convictions. We need more convictions of basically cult leaders. And the Mivilud report of 2005 notes approvingly the adoption in 2001 of the law called Abu Picard has constituted a remarkable advance in jurisprudence in the battle against the misdemeanor of fraudulent abuse and state of ignorance. Um, so the anti-sect agenda behind this law was to reinforce the prevention and suppression of sectarian movements that infringe on human rights and fundamental freedoms by extending the criminal liability of corporations for certain offenses leading to their dissolution. The new law limits the public outreach of sectarian movements and punishes the abuse of the state of ignorance or weakness of individuals. These are quotes from um, some of the lawyers who were um, rejoicing in, in the Abu Pikar law after it was passed. Now the penalties for those convicted of Abu de Faiblesse, um, three years of prison and 375,000 euros of amend, uh, or fine, I get fines. Often the guilty receive a suspended sentence called avec sursi, and convictions may impose heavy fines or amends, damages to the victims. So on top of paying a fine, um, the people convicted would have to compensate the, the victims. Now, Mivilud, which is the um, interministerial mission to uh, fight against dérive sectaire at the heart of the National Assembly, created a special police squadron called Caimades, or um, in 2008, and their mission was to crack down on sects. So they were trained to recognize brainwashing. They had dogs who could sniff drugs and money. And six of the people I talked to who were arrested and charged with Abu de Faiblesse um, had the experience of this squadron um, raiding them at dawn. 
Now, one of the most unpleasant things about being accused of a bit of faiblesse is you have to go through the French legal system, which seems to be quite a nightmare. The first stage is that victims would complain, usually to their local um, anti-cult group, which would be called ADFI. So there'd be ADFIs in the major cities. And then there would be a procureur who would um, uh, basically be in charge of the whole thing and he, and he would appoint a judge, a juge d'instruction, whose job would be to gather evidence to prove the guilt of the person accused. And then there would be court hearings. Um, so it's a very complex system and if the person is convicted, they can go to the um, Court of Appeal and eventually the Supreme Court, though not many people do that. And um, it takes a very long time. And also it's very expensive. Now I collected 31 cases of what the media calls gurus charged with abus de faiblesse. And these cases are from 2002 2017. Now there doesn't seem to be a central place to get the list of cases. I have talked to different lawyers who've been involved in these cases and all of them said, no, no, you can't really find it, them all out. Uh, there's no central place that records them. So I had this very, um, well, rather embarrassing method that, of collecting data which I'm a bit embarrassed to tell you about, but all I did is went to Google and typed in guru, and then I typed in abu de faiblesse, and then all these cases popped up with photographs of the uh, supposed gurus and uh, you know, media sensational accounts of their trials and, their, and the allegations. So I don't have time obviously to go through all these, but I'm going to analyze um, these cases and try to put them in categories. So who are these gurus who abuse weakness? Well, there seem to be four categories. They're the alternative therapists, sometimes voyant, or seers, and healers, alternative healers. And Mivelud uh, made a point in announcing several times that they wanted to go after the, the small time um, therapists who were gurus. Second, uh, fraudsters, people who are accused of extortion, charging money for religious services, which aren't considered religious services, but rather are considered scams. And uh, blanchiment d'argent, uh, and uh, ble what do you call it, money laundering, and travail dissimulé. I'm um, getting people to work for free or getting um, people who are not legally in France to work. Third, there are sex offenders. And these are predat predatory prophets who seduce their followers or polygamists or uh, men who seduce children who are underage, child molesters and rapists. And fourth, there are immigrant religions, so there are priests, imams, gurus, roshis, shamans from other traditions that are unfamiliar to the French, and these people would be uh, accused of abus de faiblesse. And a, a striking example is a voodoo priestess from Martinique, and she was doing exactly the same thing she did in Martinique, which was considered normal, like having shamanistic trance and and sprinkling blood on the Virgin Mary and you know, helping people heal, chanting. But when she did it in, in France, it was considered abus de faiblesse, especially since she charged money for it. Now the very first case, or the very first application of this law was Arnaud Moussi, and I went and interviewed him in 2005. That's a picture of me with his, him and his twin brother. And he was the very first person found guilty, and he was sentenced to three years in prison, a vex for C, so he didn't have to serve it, and given a fine. And it was a very strange case because 
uh, it, it, it started because a member of his group committed suicide, and then the newspapers um, reported that two other members had attempted suicide. So I thought, this is very weird. Here's a leader who can make his followers commit suicide at long distance. He wasn't anywhere near them. There's no record of him ask, telling them to do this. But in fact, the two people who the media said were committing suicide were really uh, rock climbers who fell. So they, they fabricated that, that story. Now, a, a recent case came up which prompted me to start studying this again. And this is uh, an engineer from Toronto. He also lives in Bombay, India half the year. His name is Nila Makija. And he's very interested in New Age meditation. He's also interested in Hindu spirituality. From a child, he was always going to hear different spiritual masters speak. And he is really insulted at the way the French use the word guru, which is a term of respect in his own country. He said, they have no respect for my culture. And all he was doing in France was visiting his long-term girlfriend, who he saw every summer, and they go on a little holiday together. And she happened to be an, uh, a therapist who did meditation workshops. So he was assisting her at her workshop, and he said what this amounted to really was cleaning up dirty tissues on the floor because people were blowing their nose because they were hyperventilating, and putting on music, and moving things around. And he didn't speak a word of French, so he was just her, you know, uh, working for her, um, as her as her friend. And in the middle of the night, the uh, Kaimadis, this very scary squadron, um, invaded the house and arrested her and him. And he was accused of, they accused him of being sent by the Osho movement in India to teach French therapists how to, how to extort money from French citizens by using mysterious Indian techniques. So they accused him of um, using, uh, thank you, of using um, candles and Indian music to create a mysterious atmosphere. And when he told the investigating judge, we bought the candles at Ikea and the music was supplied by her own clients who brought their favorite music. I didn't supply any of the music. And then she said, well, you were, you know, you were preaching Indian philosophy. And, and he said, no, I don't speak a word of French. I didn't speak to anybody. So then she wrote in her report, um, he was influencing people through his silence, manipulating people through his silence. And it took him two and a half years before it went to court. And during that time, he was under country arrest. He could not leave France. He had to spend about 60,000 euros on lawyers. And when he finally, and they froze all his accounts, so he had to borrow money from his sons-in-laws. And when he finally went to court, he had a very good lawyer who got the charges dismissed. He was completely free. Um, but, you know, the damage to his life had been very serious in terms of business, you know, and so on, and health and so on. Um, so I think it's, there's something wrong with the law where a tourist comes to visit his girlfriend and is, is framed for being a dangerous manipulator and has to spend two and a half years in the... Um, okay. So I'll quickly go through these. Uh, so the therapists are one group of people accused of a beautiful bless. And here are some of them. This, this, there's a funny story about this one. He, he, he owns a sex club. Yeah, he owns a sex club called Villa Panther. And he channels his Italian grandfather and he told one woman that his grandfather had spoken to her dead father, and they both thought it would be a good idea if Philippe and she jumped into bed together. So she actually did, and then she regretted it, and she was one of the people who complained. You know. So he's gone to jail for four years, five years. Then this woman does primal scream therapy, which is in, the, in North America, California would be normal, but in France, French, it's, France it's seen as a beautiful bless. Um, and here is a cap. 
did this little illustration showing about the overkill attacking this poor little therapist. Then there's this woman who, who earned lots of money doing recovered memory, you know, hypnotherapy. And it's called Faux Souvenir en Induit in French. And she, and there's an association which is fighting this new practice, which is very influential in the court. And she and this other therapist both got quite heavy financial amends and damages and had to, and one year prison. I, do I have to stop now, Massimo? Do me do, okay. Um, sexual predators, therapists, and rapes. Some of these people use sex in their, in their, ther in their group therapy in a way, in the same way that Rajneesh, you know, the Rajneesh group would use it, or Gestalt. And some of them are communalists, and we know from studying communal, communes from a sociological perspective that often they um, disrupt couples and rearrange family life. So those kind of patterns, which you would find in a, in a commune, are seen as um, a faiblesse. And Robert Ledin, who um, or, was the founder of a Christian esoteric commune, was accused by his top female administrator of raping her for 22 years. And you'd think after 22 years, a rape becomes something slightly different. But anyway. Um, the, there's some really bizarre allegations against this yoga teacher. And this was a Hare Krishna um, ex-member who started his own little Krishna thing where he was Krishna and teenage girls were the gopis. And so he was uh, sent to jail for 10 year, 14 years for molestation of minors. Um, here are some more therapists. Um, some of them were accused of forcing their, their clients to, um, have, to be in orgies, like this woman. She didn't actually. And Zeus um, would have sort of ancient Greek bacchanals. And he seemed to be into t tantra sex and something that happened when he was in uh, Morocco came back to haunt him years later. Here's Robert Ledin. Um, this guy was a Pentecostalist who had young ladies working for free in his church typing up memos and things. And he seemed to be a bit of a ladies man. So he was accused of um, a beautiful bless. Now some of these men had quite heavy prison sentences and usually it's the, the men who um, seduce underage girls or the men who get lots of money, extort lots of money. Those are the ones who'd be punished most heavily. And some of them cross boundaries and do both. And another interesting thing is often the, the wife or, or the children or the husband of the accused um, are also accused because they assisted them in their work and some of them end up in jail and having to pay fines. Um, these are some of the outstanding fraudsters. Thier Thierry Tilly is a really a remarkable story about this confidence trickster who fooled a whole family, a wealth, wealthy family, and, and had them th give away all their property. Um, here is the poor voodoo priestess who is just doing her the job that she do in Martinique and in France. Now she has to go to jail for three years. And this was, this woman, Eliane Deschamps, is uh, a devout Catholic and she claimed to receive regular apparitions of the virgins. So she would be quite normal in French history, but According to the new law, she is uh, abusing the weakness of her followers. They give her some kind of monthly you know, salary uh, because she shares her virgin visions with them. And she has a little community living with her. So um, she was sent to jail. And since she had poor health, they let her out early since she's quite old. 
Um, okay. Here we have a confession of a voyante. You always have a, an ex-member or an apostate coming in and sort of paving the way and um, confirming, you know, the story. And some, you do have, there are four cases that I know of in which the charges of Abu de Faiblesse were dismissed. And one of them is against the leaders of the Communauté de Beatitude in Toulouse. Now, is, can I just finish off with this criticism? Okay, a final critique. From a sociological or history religions perspective, we find familiar patterns, especially in communes, um, but in France they're interpreted differently in, in psychological terms as manipulation and abuse of weakness rather than as sociological patterns that kind of spontaneously happen. From a political perspective, um, Eileen Barker talks about the protective state as opposed to the laissez-faire state, which anticipates and preempts dérive sectaire or cultic harm. And this definitely fits um, the France. Um, and there's all sorts of I, things that make it unfair, for example, the diplomats can, diplomats can say anything they want um, about the groups or their leaders and they have diplomatic immunity. So what would be considered libel in Canada in the France is just, you know, they're doing their, their work to fight cults. Um, from a legal perspective, uh, Mivilud has had workshops for judges to sensitize them to the dangers of sex. So they're, they're actually training judges to help them crack down on dangerous sects, which you might say is not very um, objective. Then the du there's a dubious status of the brainwashing theory. It's not considered scientific in the US. It's been thrown out of court because it cannot be tested. And yet in France, you have a whole law that assumes that manipulation mentale is, is a reality. Um, then the, the, there's the question of the authenticity of the victims. Sometimes a procureur will scrounge up victims. For example, in one case, he simply got a list of all the people who'd phoned the therapist, even if it was a wrong number, and he added them on his list of victims. Um, some of the victims have questionable motivations. Um, for example, there was one woman who was very jealous because her therapist had stolen her husband, so she turned her in for a beauty fabulous. Um, and there are catch-22 arguments in the court. For example, when Arno Musi went to court, um, some of his followers said, he never manipulated us. So then the woman from Yunadfi said, that shows that you're a victim because victims of manipulation mental don't realize they're victims. So this proves that he manipulated you. Th those kind of arguments come up quite often. Um, just like, you know, he manipulated people through his silence. So the Abu Pikar law enables the state to override contracts between therapists and clients to punish hitherto unpunishable misdeeds like therapists inducing false memories or men seducing adult women by focusing on the mysterious, invisible, unprovable, but ineluctable power of manipulation mental. So you sort of imagine this dark cloud, this mysterious, powerful cloud happening. Well, the, um, the guru is convincing a woman to do something. Oh, finally, it imposes heavier penalties for relatively minor misdeeds now classified as delete. Okay, thank you.